Hello and welcome to the End the Om podcast, where you will learn to master the business of yoga with guests from around the world who have experienced becoming successful yoga teachers, studio owners, and much more. Now, here's your host, Amanda Kingsmith. Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of the MBOM podcast. I'm really excited to have guests here, Ann and Brandon from the Yoga Nomads. And Ann and Brandon are a traveling couple who also teach yoga. So they're definitely aligned with my two favorite things, or the two things that I'm most passionate about, which are traveling and yoga. And I discovered them online. I'm not really sure how. I went to one person's page and then somehow ended up on their page and was like, wow, these guys are doing some cool stuff. I really want to talk to them. Uh, fortunately for me, they said yes. And as we talked throughout the interview, we just discovered more and more how aligned we are in terms of promoting the business side of yoga, as well as really personally aligned in terms of our goals as individuals. And one of my big goals alongside my partner, Ryan, is to be able to be location independent and to be able to travel the world and teach yoga and practice yoga and teach the business of yoga. And that's exactly what Ann and Brandon are doing. Uh, They're both yoga teachers and does more teaching than Brandon does. And Brandon really focuses on the business side. And then You'll see on their website, lots of posts written by Anne. And something that I really love about their website is that they're both really candid. They're both really authentic. They talk about things like what it's really like to backpack around the world, what it's really like to be yoga teachers living nomadically out of a backpack. And I'm really excited to share this interview with you guys because we talk about a ton of really awesome tips and tricks for people who are looking to become nomadic as a yoga teacher who want to travel and combine their love of teaching yoga with their love of travel, as well as some really practical pieces of business advice for any type of yoga teacher. So regardless of if you like to travel or not, or if your goals and dreams are to become a nomadic yoga teacher, I think that there's some really good learnings that you can get out of this episode. So without further ado, here's Ann and Brandon. Awesome. Well, thanks again so much for coming on the podcast. It's super cool to have you guys here and yeah. especially joining me from Costa Rica. That's amazing. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for having thank us. You. Yeah. Do you guys want to start by telling me how you first got into yoga? Sure. Okay. So for me, I started in college. It was just a supplemental thing to um, add to the weightlifting and the running routine. And I went with a bunch of guys from the fraternity, and we had fun, and I just kind of kept with it. Um, And then it took about three years of casual practice before I started taking it serious. And so about after three years, then I started getting into it, found out about teacher training, and it was kind of at a crossroads with my work life. I was sitting at the desk all day in corporate America kind of wanting more, and I saw this as an outlet. So I just went in trying to learn more about yoga, try something new, and it turned out to be something that I loved. Cool. That's awesome. My experience is a little bit different, but sort of similar in that I casually practiced on and off, went to a gym, um, did some yoga classes to supplement my workout routine. Um, I didn't fall in love with it at first. I actually walked out of one of my first yoga classes. I just thought it was too boring and slow and didn't really understand what all the mumbo jumbo was about. Um, But then I met Brandon and he encouraged me to try it again and pretty much just fell in love with it right away. I think it was like at a point in my life where it just spoke to me more. What was being said in class resonated a lot with what I was experiencing in my life outside of yoga. Um, So to parallel what Brandon said, I was also at a corporate desk job kind of contemplating my life and what it meant and what else I wanted to do and yoga teacher training. Um, was kind of that outlet for me as well. And he had gone through it just before me, and I was able to witness this awesome transformation in him and kind of wanted the same thing. So the rest is history. That's amazing. Yeah. And so had you guys quit your jobs before you actually did your teacher trainings? Was it like, I'm going to quit and become yoga teachers? No. No, not at all. (laughs) What what was the process like that for that? We were working 40 plus hours a week and doing our teacher training at the same time. Wow. So it was, it was a lot. We had to sacrifice our friends and any type of 
free time that we could possibly want was all dedicated to yoga. Yeah. Um, which I think is a lot different than most people who just do a month long intensive or mm-hmm. something like that without other commitments. Mm-hmm. It worked out for us, I would say. Yeah. It's and, a- yeah, that's awesome. And then did you guys start teaching right away? I did not. Um, I never had an interest to teach, to be honest. For me, it was more about learning about about yoga and deepening my own practice. And through the training, I thought, you know, maybe I would want to do this, but it's really just not where my passion is. Yeah, and I took I took the road of teaching. I wanted to teach right away and continue on that path. So yeah, I've been teaching ever since. That's awesome. <laughs> and then, what inspired you guys to quit your full time jobs? Um. You know, we had been thinking about travel, I think, ever since we met. One of our very first conversations in a breakout session in a conference room at work was about travel. So it's something that we had always communicated with each other about. Um, And it wasn't until I lost my job. I lost my job right after teacher training, um, probably about a month after. And that was kind of the catalyst to get us to to buy the one-way ticket and start a different venture. That's amazing. It's it's interesting because I feel like I've heard a lot of stories about people who get laid off and it's like actually the best thing that ever happens to them. <laughs> I would completely echo that sentiment <laughs> for sure. Yeah. I've talked to my boyfriend about it quite a bit because we worked in between two big backpacking trips. We worked for two years and he's like, I wish that my job would have laid me off after the first <laughs> year working. He's like, I think that would have been better for my life. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that funny that you start to think that way? <laughs> yeah. And I don't think it's like, obviously it would have been, feelings would have been different at the time, but looking back on it, he's like, I just think that one year was enough and I didn't have like the courage to quit. So if somebody would have just said, you're fired, I would have been out. Right. And that's funny because I think most people are stuck in their job and it's okay. You know, if you hate your job, you're ready to quit. It's easy to quit. Yeah. If you love the job, you know, you're going to stay and it's easy to stay. But most people I feel like are stuck in that middle ground where provides them some comfort, you know, they see what it could be like, but they don't want to quit, kind of feels nice, and they just get trapped there. Yeah, definitely. I can relate to that. What were the reactions from your friends and family when you guys were like, yeah, we're like done with this corporate thing for a while, we're going to go travel? (laughs) I think overall, they were very supportive, surprisingly supportive. Um, but at the same time, you know, there was some concern, I think from our family and, and closest friends about, is this right for you? How are you going to make money? How are you going to survive? Um, but overall I felt an overwhelming amount of support and love. I don't know about you. For sure. I mean, of course there's some people in the office who just don't get it and they'll never get it. Mm -hmm. And they're like, you're crazy. You're throwing your life away. You have a future here you know, go be a bum for a year and then come back to real life kind of mindset. But most people, all the friends were supportive. My parents know if I want something bad enough, I'm going to get it yeah. one way or another. So they just kind of like, yeah, do it. They trust me. So yeah. as long as you're not doing anything outrageous, I think they have our back. <laughs> That's nice to have that support from family and friends. I know. I feel like I have a few friends who are still like, so what do you do? Like, what are you doing with your life? For sure. <laughs> like, maybe one day you'll get it. It's fun. <laughs> and so when you guys first started traveling, where did you go? Where was your first stop? We bought a one-way ticket to India. <laughs> cool. Yeah, it was It was quite the change from what we initially thought. We were actually planning on going to South America and teaching at hostels and guest houses and like working out trades and exchanges along the way. But then we met up with a fellow travel blogger couple from Minneapolis one day and they convinced us that Southeast Asia was the way to go. (laughs) And we could stretch our dollars so much further there. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think India just came about because it's the birthplace of yoga and that's kind of where this all started. So yeah, we started in India and then traveled all throughout Southeast Asia, India, or excuse me, Sri Lanka, Nepal, where else? Yeah, yeah. Everywhere. Most of Southeast Asia. And then we did a stopover in Tokyo on the way home. Nice. Went from like dirty backpacker, Cambodia to <laughs> warm Tokyo with no warm clothes, <laughs> no nice clothes. Um, quick yeah. stop 
the store and we're all right. <laughs> yeah, for sure. We did that from uh, Bangkok to Melbourne and we like landed in Australia and they're like, we need to search your bags. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you guys look gross. <laughs> yeah. You know that plane all too well. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And what was India like? Like, what did you guys do there? What was the yoga like? It's a, such a hard question because, in my opinion, India isn't one country. It's yeah. more like yeah. 20 countries combined. Each state has its own language. The people look different. The food's different. The culture's different. So to try and describe it, and we were only there for three months. Yeah. I would feel offended. I feel like we'd be offended in India to say anything really concrete. Um, but it's a magical place. The people lead with their hearts. Where here in America, let's say you talk to someone, it's what do you do? And we kind of judge each other's social status and feel each other out. There they just dive right in. If they like you, they love you. And they want to know about you and your family and really serious topics. And they're not afraid to say those type of things that we usually hold tight as Westerners. Wow, I love that. Yeah. yeah. It catches me off guard because as a man, I don't share my emotions or put them out there as much as I could or probably should. Yeah. And the guys there are not like that. So they'll just like, they'll hug if they want to. They express how they're feeling. Men hold hands there all the time, and it's a friendship. Thing. Wow, that's really beautiful. For it sure. is, yeah. It was a, it was every emotion you could possibly feel all at once. I mean, it was yeah. chaotic and intense, and amazing and horrific, and dirty and clean and beautiful and ugly, like all at the same time. It's it's hard. It's a hard country to even make sense of or comprehend. And I think that the beauty of it is really in how you process it once you leave. So there are moments that I can still think back of, still think back on clear as day today and see how it's impacted my life. You know, it's just, it was so wonderful and I can't wait to get back. But I was also really excited to leave. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That sounds amazing. That's pretty on point with everything I've heard about India. India is still on my list. So it's really cool to hear about that. You'll have to get there. <laughs> yeah, Definitely. <laughs> Go slow. Take your time. Two weeks in India, in my opinion, is a mistake. Yeah. Um, the beauty of India is the little details in between your plans. Cool. You go to the Taj Mahal, and yeah, okay, maybe like 20 minutes of the Taj Mahal is cool, but your experience getting there, or waiting in line, or sitting on the train in a random conversation, or just drinking chai on the street and watching it go by. That's what I think is the beauty. Yeah, I love that. That's such a perfect way to describe travel in general is you go to see these certain things and it's like kind of everything else that fills it in that really makes travel spectacular. Oh, exactly. Sure. And we spent some, some time doing yoga there. We spent two weeks in Mysore um, trying out Ashtanga and trying to get a feel for that, which we don't love. <laughs> we tried. We <laughs> tried. We it two weeks and it's not I yeah. teach at a studio that does like 6 a.m. my sore like every morning and they don't leave till like 10 a.m. It's so crazy. Like because people can come. Some people start at 6 and go till 9. Some people start at 7, go till 10. And I was actually thinking this morning, I was like, at some point I should probably like give this Ashtanga thing like a chance. And then I was like, eh, I don't know if it's my time yet. <laughs> yeah. It'll come. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe in India. Did you guys do any trainings or anything like that while you were there? We didn't, no. We did a retreat. Oh, we did one retreat, I guess, in Goa. Cool. Yeah, which was cool. It was an interesting experience. I was actually able to lead um, a couple classes for them because somebody didn't show up. So I raised <laughs> my hand and said, I'd love to be a part of this and teach some classes. And that was a really fun experience. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Do you feel like that would have happened if you hadn't put yourself out there? Or was it really like putting yourself forward? That's a good question. I think um, I'm a very open person and I think I wear my heart on my sleeve. And so they probably, if, if, if I had been more closed minded and closed altogether, it probably wouldn't have presented itself. But I was probably putting out there that, hey, here I am. I'd love more experience teaching. And it just came back like that. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's awesome. And then yeah. going through the rest of the countries, were you guys able to teach while you were there? A little bit, yeah. We didn't um, make it as much of a focus as 
maybe we initially intended on mm-hmm. just because travel gets in the way totally uh, for a very good reason. But we were able to teach pretty much in every country, like pop up locations at different guest houses that we stayed at, just teaching for donation or teaching for our friends and stuff on the beach. Yeah. I'm curious because it's something that I, I really like being in a stable life because you can get those teaching opportunities at studios and you can find private clients and you can really like build yourself up there. But then I also love travel and m- my boyfriend and I want to spend the next couple of years sort of fairly nomadic and I don't want to lose that yoga teaching. So I'm so curious kind of how you guys have found teaching on the road to be. And like, Absolutely. yeah, what are some of the challenges that you found? Is it mostly putting yourself out there? I think the one thing you have to ask yourself is, do you want to travel and a little bit of teach, or do you want to focus on building a routine and staying in one place? Yeah. Because when we started the first year in Asia, we were moving pretty fast. You know, we spent a month in Bali, two weeks in Mysore, a few weeks here and there, but it was mostly three days in a place and leave. You mm-hmm. mm-hmm. can't really teach like that. So after that first year of travel, we started traveling slower, where we'd rent an apartment for three months. And during that time, it's much easier to find a stable teaching gig. It's much easier to do work online and kind of get into a routine. Yeah. I think that's my biggest recommendation for people who want to travel and teach. Finding that, like slowing down a little bit. Yeah. Definitely. And you still get the little serendipitous moments that we all love from travel. And I think it's almost better because you get to know a place deeply. You know, you get to know the mango lady on the corner that you talk to every day or, um, you know, the people in town that they start to recognize you. And then all of a sudden they're a little bit more interested and you're over at their house for dinner. (laughs) Do another. I love that. That's amazing. (laughs) Days and you're out of there, which is fine as well. Yeah. Did you guys find that you you just got tired of hopping around or definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's physically and mentally exhausting. I mean, even towards the end of the initial trip in 2014, where we traveled for about 12 months, um, the last few months we were just slowing down that we would find ourselves like locking ourselves in the, the guest house room for eight hours at a time, just watching TV. <laughs> <laughs> just going to the movies three nights in a row in Saigon because you just crave a little bit of home (laughs) and air conditioning and popcorn. Yeah. But (laughs) yeah, definitely. It's just, it's tiring. It's tiring always having to find a place to stay. It's tiring moving from place to place and meeting people and getting to know them for two days and then saying goodbye. I can definitely relate to that. Just the, after you backpack for a while, you just need like some normalcy in your life. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we found that slowing down has really just fostered growth for our business. Um, It's helped us just be able to focus, stay hyper-focused on scaling our online businesses and just giving more thought to that, which is really important for us, especially to keep up this lifestyle, you know? Like, we want to be able to continue to travel and be nomadic and live wherever we want, but we also need a sustainable business to help fund those travels. <laughs> yeah, I feel yeah. that. <laughs> uh, when did you guys start your, I don't want to call it a blog. I feel like a blog is, do you guys call it a blog or? We call it a blog and a website and a okay. bunch of things. So it's fine. It depends who <laughs> we're talking to. Yeah. yeah. I feel like I just think of blog as like. Uh, a diary. Yeah. And then like you're, you buy your website URL and you're like, hey, I'm legitimate now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you guys are obviously legitimate. legitimate. Um, when did you guys start your start your website um july of 2013 is kind of when we cemented the idea that we're going to and i think it took us a couple months to plan it out and design it i think it was september of 2013 that we officially launched it Mm -hmm. and did it start as just like a way to capture your travels your yoga experiences yeah i think we noticed right away there was no travel yoga blogs And we had a lot of friends who were traveling and doing yoga and here and there, and there just wasn't a lot of resources out there. So it was kind of initially helping other people travel and teach or travel and practice yoga. And then also kind of an outlet for us and potentially a business down the road. And then at what point did you decide that, okay, yes, we're going to make this a business? 
Good yeah. question. I would the say end of 2014. Yeah. I'd say about a year after we launched it, mm-hmm. we were probably 10 or 11 months into traveling at that point, and we started making some money, and our traffic was growing, and we weren't putting in full-time hours by any means. This was a secondary thing the first year. Um, but then once we started making a little money, you know, you kind of taste it, and you kind of think, well, maybe we could do this forever, or maybe we could scale this $500 a month to $5,000 a month to $10,000 a month, etc. Yeah. And did you guys start making money through like affiliate programs or were you selling things? Um, Affiliate links and also different types of sponsored text links, which we don't do anymore. Um, But a couple years ago, the money was good there. And that's mainly it. And some freelance work, some consulting work that's not directly tied to the Yoga Nomads website. But through that, we were able to book higher paying gigs externally. That's awesome. And in terms of the things that people reach out to you the most about, like what are people who are in sort of like the nomadic field of yoga, like what do they want to know from you guys? Good question. I think we get two common silos of questions. One is the, hey, I'm thinking about quitting my job and traveling, help me with X, Y, and Z. And there's a lot of those people out there. And I don't know if that's a symptom of, today and how people are unhappy with their jobs or what but that's common and then the other one is about teaching how to find teaching jobs or how do I build my resume how do I build my presence online just different people who want to kind of do what we're doing in a way um, and make a pivot in their own life and chase yeah. their dreams that's that's really cool to have like people reaching out to you that are inspired by what you're doing and want to learn more from you. Yeah, it feels good. For yeah. sure. Yeah. It it's actually, nice to know that you're making a difference. For sure. Totally. It actually led to what we're really excited about right now is a course. So we're, we're meeting with a lot of yoga teachers one-on-one and offering some consulting. And the common thread is I want to go online. I need to go online, but I don't know how. And I'm intimidated, I'm not good at it, or I'm not techie, etc. <clears throat> so what we're developing is a course helping non-techie uh, um, yoga teachers market themselves online. So get a website up, learn the basics of social media, what is a newsletter for, etc. I love we're that. We're hoping to that um, mid-summer this year. Yeah, that's awesome. And so are you hoping to develop like a community with it of people who will grow with you guys? Definitely. So part of the course, um, as a member of the course, you'll get put into a group of other people like yourself and there'll be a message board and ways to communicate so you can share ideas and learn from each other. Yeah. I think that's a great idea because I feel like, I mean, even for me, like I released a yoga for beginners course on a platform called Udemy and even the filming aspect of it is so hard if you've never done it before. Mm-hmm. For sure. And I was like, I've done this like whole podcast thing for a while now. It is not the same. <laughs> Definitely. And then there's like the marketing yourself online. I feel like that's so key if you want people to find you and it's, it's really challenging in a lot of ways. So it is the learning curve is steep initially. I think, but you can teach yourself almost everything if you're willing to put the time in. Yeah. So what yeah. we can do is give people the shortcut. Just follow these steps, step by step, and you have a website. You know. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Just give them the information they need to know. Exactly. Sure. And I think the stats are 13,000 new yoga teachers are finishing their training each year in America alone. Oh. And the number is going up by at least 20% a year the last three years. So there's way more yoga teachers than there is teaching gigs. Yeah, definitely. That's a pretty crazy statistic. I knew there was like a ton of yoga teachers being pumped out of teacher trainings, but I didn't realize it was that many. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's crazy. And to be fair, the yoga studios, the economics of a yoga studio are harsh. So if you're not offering trainings or programming, it's not easy to make money as a studio. Yeah, definitely. I think that's that's a big topic that I've covered on my podcast because I think one thing that I found from, I have a degree in business. And so I went from this like corporate setting to being in this yoga setting. And I was like, I feel like nobody is taking like the business of yoga seriously. Like they want to teach, but they're like, 
not doing anything to like promote themselves or to actually like make a career out of it. And that's where my whole thing came from. So I think it's really cool. I feel like you guys are kind of on the same wavelength as me, which I love. For sure. I've noticed that too. (laughs) Definitely. And you're right. Because if you want to be a successful yoga teacher, you need to be an entrepreneur. You need to act like an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. If not, it's just going to be a little thing you do on the side and it's going to be a struggle. Yeah, so awesome. I think there's nothing wrong if people want to like be a yoga teacher as like their side hustle or their thing that like, you know, they do on their weekend because they really love it. I think that's cool, too. Definitely. But I think if you want to be like full time and that's all you want to do and you want to make enough money to keep the lifestyle that you like, then you've got to treat it like a career. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. What are some of you guys' business biggest learnings that you've found through teaching and the business you've created that you could share with people on the podcast? Um, keep trying. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you seemingly fail or you fail in your own eyes, somebody else will see it as a success. Somebody else will take something away from that. Um, and that, that goes for yoga and I think business, you know, I think it's so easy to get caught up in, Oh, well, that sucked. I don't ever want to do it again. But the only way you're going to get better is persistence. Um, so, yeah, it's just keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. Don't give up. I love that. And one that came to me would be uh, celebrate the easy wins or the little wins. Because, you know, in my head, I want to have this giant business helping lots of people. And it might take several years to get there. And if I'm always focused on that end goal, you know, it's sometimes hard to stay motivated, but if you focus on short, bite-sized goals and celebrate those wins, it's a lot easier to stay focused. Yeah, definitely. That's great advice. And what's your biggest piece of advice for actually finding teaching jobs abroad? Do you guys have like a resource that you use or anything that you'd recommend? Yeah, there's a couple different things. First and foremost, stay really open and be really communicative. So if you are open to experiences and opportunities in every way, it might not be the perfect job, but take whatever you can get. Um, In addition to that, one of the resources that we use, aside from simply emailing a yoga studio and asking them if we can help help out in any way or do an exchange, would be yogatrade, yoga yogatrade.com. Um, it's a great resource that houses yoga teaching jobs all over the world. And um, typically they're all done on an exchange or trade program. So you go and teach in exchange for accommodation or food or a combination of the both. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. And the other thing is make sure you do have a website of some sort. I think going back to the 13,000 yoga teachers a year, and they're all <laughs> emailing those studios, you know, emailing Yoga Bar and they'll Everyone wants to teach there. But if you don't have a website... Yoga Barn is pretty awesome. (laughs) It is pretty awesome. Um, But how are you going to get that job? How are you going to stand out if you don't have your own online presence? You know, prove to those studios that you take it seriously, that you already have a following, that this is something that you want to do and here's who I am. Mm -hmm. You know, it's your online resume. It doesn't have to be complex, but it needs to be there. Yeah, I think that's really good advice and... You know, even if it's just a blog, like it's dot WordPress, at least it's something that can tell people who you are and what you're about and what you're passionate about with your teaching, which is pretty cool. Right. They did a study with hiring managers. And in the study, I think, I don't remember the number, it's not important, but pretty much every hiring manager, the first thing they do is they Google you. And they see where your hands are. Where do you? What's your presence online? What do you do? What little projects do you work on? How can we learn more about you? So knowing that, if you're not online, you're missing out. Yeah, definitely. I've heard that as well. Where you know it's really important to Google yourself and see what comes up, especially if you're a common name. Like I know my boyfriend's name is the exact same as somebody who is. There was like a free Ryan Ferguson dot com for a while because there's like this other guy named Ryan Ferguson who went to jail. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> so it's like always good to Google yourself and know what's going to pop up. <laughs> I'm not, not that guy. <laughs> it doesn't look anything like him. So it's like a different nationality, different race. <laughs> but yeah. it's just kind of funny to think about, you know, what's out there about you. And even if it is 
say there's something about you, like you never know what somebody else has put online about yourself. So figure out, you know, what other people are going to see when they search you. Yeah. Good call. (laughs) (laughs) And obviously I don't want you to give out the information for the course you're creating, but is there any like little tidbits of knowledge you could give listeners just sort of about, you know, things that are coming out with your course and some of the advice that you're going to provide people with? Yeah. Yeah. I think one that is easy and probably the most effective relative to the time put in is starting a newsletter program. So you can go to MailChimp, sign up for a free account and start collecting email addresses of your students. Mm -hmm. And you can send these students little tidbits of information once a week about yoga, where you're teaching, etc. Um, and it's free and easy. And once you have a newsletter program, you're going to be building your following and getting to know your students a little bit better through email. And if you're stuck in one location or living in one location, your students are kind of in that same geographical location. But if you start a newsletter program, people can be anywhere in the world learning from you. Yeah, I love that. That's one of the pieces of advice that I've tried to provide through this podcast too, is the importance of capture people's email addresses because even if they don't read every single thing you put out, there might be that one subject line that captures captures their attention or you'll be in the back of their mind when their friend says, oh, I want to start yoga, but I don't know where to start. And they're like, oh, I know somebody who does that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then down the road, after you've been providing all this value to your followers, you can say, hey, I have a training coming up. Here's the sign up. Yes. Yeah, I love that. That's amazing. And a tip along with that stealing straight from Gary Vaynerchuk is the jab, jab, punch. (laughs) So it's give, 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 and then ask for something. Yes. Or trying to give out three times as much as you ask for. Yeah, I think that that's a a good thing to remember. I know something with you know, starting a travel podcast is I really wanted to make money right away. And my boyfriend was like, no, we got to like prove to people that we know what we're talking about first. And I was like, let's just charge them for stuff. uh, (laughs) It's something that I really learned. Like you, as much as you want to make money right away, people are not going to give you money till they trust you. Yeah, for sure. That's so true. Have you guys delved into YouTube at all? No, just barely. We have a couple of YouTube videos up and yeah. we know we need to. So we started filming some things, but we're still a little shy putting them out there. Uh, I feel yeah, <laughs> GoPro is like my next device that I want to buy. We're like, okay, we need a GoPro for the next time we're on the road. So I just thought I'd ask. I just wasn't sure if you guys are on YouTube yet, but I feel like YouTube's a, it's an interesting channel. It's something that I don't know too much about. Same. So, cool. Um, have you guys taught workshops or anything along the way? Is that something have, you, you no. recommend to people? Yeah, I would say, if, especially if you have something in your practice, whether it's philosophy or the physical practice that you are really passionate about or specialize in, absolutely. That's something you can just go to a studio owner and say, hey, I'm here in town. I, I'm really great at handstands. I would love to help lead a workshop. I can even help market for you, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, we haven't personally led, led any workshops ourselves. We're, we're trying to couple like, well, I'll let you explain that. (laughs) Oh yeah. What we want to do is continue, continually teach new yoga teachers how to market themselves online. So if you go back to your 200 hours, you probably had a couple hour lecture on the business of yoga. Yeah. (laughs) Over 200 hours, two hours, put that little tiny thing that, it's is extremely <laughs> important. Yeah. Uh, what we want to do is offer a quick module, either through Skype or in person with teacher trainers, and just offer a little bit of the marketing side that they're not getting there. Yeah. So. I think that that's an amazing idea because when I think back to my business of yoga lecture, I remember being like excited for it because I was like, okay, cool. I'm ready. And they're like, <laughs> get certified with Yoga Alliance. Create a resume. <laughs> All right, now moving on to like lateral stretching. And I was like, what? (laughs) For sure. I was like, I don't know how to make a career out of get registered with Yoga Alliance and create a resume. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, there's just not enough resources out there. So we're hoping to fill that gap by being able to maybe take a couple days or do a workshop 
tagging on to a teacher training at the local studio, teaching people how to build that presence online and how to really create a business out of yoga. Yeah. Yes. What would you tell somebody if they're like, you know, I just want to teach pretty locally in my city. I don't want an online presence. I'm not looking to be like Instagram famous or anything. What sort of advice would you give for that type of yoga teacher? Advice for marketing? Or yeah, just- in terms of like, you know, if they're really resistant to sort of this being an online person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I would say create a meetup a meetup yoga class yeah. uh, on something that you're good at and just hold it every Wednesday at the local park or something like that. Cool. And you'll just start getting a whole bunch of new people coming to check you out. And then you can say, Hey, I also teach here and I also teach there. And I think piggybacking off of that, maybe your meetup is you're really good at teaching yoga to people with addiction. And so that's your specialty, like building that brand um, is really important as a yoga instructor in any way. So perhaps if you're not wanting to go online and market yourself that way, just saying, like putting out there in your community, hey, I'm really good with this. Here's my niche. That's great advice. Yeah, I think that's awesome. I was just curious because I feel like a lot of times there's, I've, I've met quite a few yoga teachers actually who are like, oh, I think I should get a website, but I don't really know kind of exactly who you guys are targeting. It's like, well, yeah, you probably should. That's, that's pretty key. <laughs> <Right>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they just, there's like a resistance to it. And I don't know if it's fear of putting yourself out there co- combined with resistance to technology, both of those together. I know technology can be a huge one. And sometimes I want to throw my laptop because technology sucks. <laughs> At the same time as being awesome. Yeah, because here we are. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And you guys are in Costa Rica and I'm in the U.S. (laughs) But um, yeah, I feel like, especially in the yoga community, I feel like I encounter some resistance to that. And the funny thing is we just purchased a new domain for our course. And from purchasing the domain to setting up the WordPress, the hosting to logging in everything. Mm-hmm. It took less than 30 minutes and we're already designing a new website. Yeah. And it probably Someone didn't cost service. very much, eh? $35 and 42 cents for an entire year. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. There's a deal. There's a special on Bluehost right now. If you need a new domain. <laughs> okay. Go good to know. <laughs> And so on your website, you guys provide a ton of resources for people who are, I think you guys have a ton of travel resources, a ton of stuff for yoga teachers. And so now you're stepping into more resources for people who are looking to start up their businesses as well. Exactly right. That's kind of our, our true expertise. We come from the business world, the sales and marketing entrepreneurship world. So combining that, just like you, leaving the corporate world and going into the yoga world, that's something we can really offer the yoga teaching community. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as I saw your website, I was like, I love what these guys are doing. Like very, very cool stuff. Likewise. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> when we found your podcast, we're like, yes. How is, <laughs> how is this not everywhere already? <laughs> it's slowly growing. It's just so new. Um, maybe I need some marketing advice as well. Despite <laughs> having a marketing degree, sometimes I feel so stuck. Yeah. Do you guys ever find that even though you've got business backgrounds, it's easier to like advise other people as opposed to yourselves? For yeah. sure. Yeah. For sure. And Marketing's hard work. Yeah. Sometimes and, I want to do hard work. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of times it's just he and I sitting here. So, you know, we can only provide so much feedback to each other, not only being in a romantic partnership, but a business partnership and a travel partnership and every kind of partnership. <laughs> You know, you only want to hear so much from that person in your life. So oftentimes it's like you just need to be around a different community of people to get that marketing advice that you probably already know, but it's just somewhere stuck inside of you and needs to be uncovered. Yeah, totally. I can relate to that. Sometimes it really sucks to hear like, oh, your logo sucks or your website sucks from somebody that you're like sleeping beside at night. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah, you're like, no, thanks. It doesn't always feel good. No. The other thing with the marketing side, in marketing classes in business school, you learn the you learn the high level principles and maybe you apply it here and there. But marketing yourself and your business, you have to take those principles, examine your business, 
prioritize what's important and then make it extremely relevant to your business. You know, there's always that disconnect. I think the schooling was nice, but really just getting my hands dirty and forcing myself to learn something new. And we're doing a roundup post right now where we asked a bunch of yoga teachers, Hey, how do you market yourself online? What's your best tip? Mm -hmm. And in order to make that successful, I studied how to create a roundup post gathering experts opinions. And if I didn't study that, it wouldn't have turned out very well. So I guess the takeaway is constantly be learning and teaching yourself new strategies and the little micro strategies, I think is what makes marketing work. Yeah. I think that that's really good advice is like learning how to do something from somebody who's already done it and who's done it well, and then applying it to your life. Definitely. Yeah, that's that's fabulous advice. And I mean, the internet is a big black hole of resources, really. <laughs> you can find anything out there. Right? Sure and you can get lost in the crap as well. Oh, yeah. gosh. Don't I know that? <laughs> it's like, how did I get on this website? <laughs> Why am I here? <laughs> and so you guys spend quite a bit of time in single places now so that you have time to focus on your business? Correct. What does your day-to-day -day look like while you're on the road now as opposed to a couple of years ago when you were going somewhere new every three days? Yeah, sure. I would say we like to be active, so we kind of build our week around our physical activity. Right now, it's going on walks with our dogs and weightlifting. Yeah. We're by the beach at surfing and yoga. Um, so kind of after we have that blocked out on the calendar, we usually work hard in the morning for a good session, take a couple hours off in the afternoon, maybe run some errands, maybe work out, and then try and get another work session in before dinner. Cool. And then cool. the evenings kind of on our own. And, and I would, add. yeah, I would definitely add, we are food fanatics. Like we have a really strong passion for healthy food and food of all kinds. So um, our day also revolves around when we're going to eat, what we're going to eat, how we're going to make it, that's where so we're going to get the food. Um, and, that's been, that. <laughs> and that's going to be, and what makes it so great about traveling slower is because we have a kitchen. A kitchen is the top, I mean, it's our top priority when finding accommodation. Do they have a kitchen? Is it nice? Is it big? Like, because we need that. We need to cook. We cook about 90% of our meals. So half our day is spent in the kitchen, whether we're roasting vegetables or blending up some smoothie in the Vitamix. Yeah. So I would say, it, you know, our days are the routines that revolve around our days are all healthy routines of some sort, whether it's active or eating or, or otherwise. Yeah. That's awesome. I feel like food is so key for travel. It is. Yeah, it really is. And yeah. to be honest, Central America doesn't have the greatest local food. No, don't tell me that. <laughs> You can find some nice food here and there, but it's not like Asia. Yeah. You know, I think in Asia, people live to eat. Mm -hmm. You know, in Thailand, the common greeting is, is translated to, have you eaten yet? Or have you eaten rice yet? <laughs> you know, so it's central to the culture. It doesn't feel that way here. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. But luckily, the tropical fruit is very good in Costa Rica. Yeah. Yeah. I think anywhere like south, the more south you get, the better the fruit gets, which is amazing. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. We're kind of obsessed. <laughs> I remember getting to Columbia and I mean, you guys are probably this way from being from Minnesota, but getting to Columbia and having a papaya. And first of all, it was like the biggest papaya I'd ever had and cut it open. And my boyfriend really likes papaya. And I, I didn't think I did. I was like, oh, I don't really like it. I'm good. He's like, why don't you just try it? So I tasted it. And I was like, is this what papaya is? Like I have never tasted this fruit like this before because we get the shittiest papayas in Canada. <laughs> oh yeah, I think our that's our exact story. It was him being like, "Yeah, babe, this papaya. Look at it. Check it out. Eat it." I'm like, "No, I don't really like the papaya. It's okay." <laughs> and now I just an hour ago I blended up this awesome papaya smoothie with ginger and lime, and it turned out amazing. Yeah, so yeah, that's yeah. one of my favorite fruits. <laughs> that's so funny that you have the same story because it's. Yeah. 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 Now I'm like, I like papaya in countries that grow papayas. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if it has to travel, I don't like it. <laughs> exactly. Right. Guess how much a papaya is per pound here right now? Oh, it's probably super cheap if it's papaya season. How much it's is it? 20 cents a pound. Oh man. That's crazy. That's outrageous. Yeah. That's such the a good price. Are in season now as well. So mangoes are about 
75 cents a pound. Oh, and they're so good. There are so many different varieties of mangoes. I don't know if you knew that. There's tons of mangoes. Tons. I, I didn't know that. That's that's pretty cool. I just think about mangoes. We get, you know, I eat whatever comes into the local grocery store, which is one variety. It's usually not very good. <laughs> it's a little bit better being in Georgia than it was up north. <laughs> oh, I bet. You're a little bit closer to the equator there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Florida produces a tremendous amount of tropical yeah. Yeah. That's why it's nice being down South. We get a lot better fruit here than, and for a better price than we did in Canada for sure. sure. And so what's next for you guys, you guys staying in Costa Rica for a while or what's the plan? Um, we have flights back to Minnesota. So we'll be in Costa Rica for another couple months. I, um, actually am doing another 200 hour teacher training Amazing. here in yeah, on the Pacific Coast in Dominica, the little beach town that we were at um, in the beginning of the year. So once once that's over, we'll go back to Minnesota, spend the summer and probably early fall there, just hanging out with the good weather and seeing our friends and family, going to a couple weddings and whatnot. Um, and then we have hopes and dreams of heading to Bali this winter. We'll see. We love Bali. We think it's really inspiring. It's a super healthy and fun place to be. So that's, that's the tentative plan. But as you know, life happens, travel happens and things could be completely different. Six yeah. Months from yeah, definitely. <laughs> I can totally relate to that. And in terms of your yoga careers, are you guys continuing to, especially you and are you continuing to try and progress your teaching? Obviously you're doing another teacher, teacher training. Yeah, I would like to. I'd like to make that a priority this year. And what's so cool about the teacher training and how that all came about was on January 1st, I made Brandon <laughs> go to the local coffee shop when we were house sitting in Minneapolis, actually, um, and write down our goals. And we both wrote down personal, professional, and health-related goals. And under my health section was completing more training and getting more hours of teaching under my belt. And I feel like I've kind of somewhat manifested that into my reality. So um, as you mentioned earlier, just being in one place for a while will help me be able to secure a teaching gig that's more consistent. Um, I do have one back home that I always go back to that they take me back willingly. Amazing. <laughs> um, be nice. And then with this additional t- teaching um, or teacher training under my belt, hopefully I'll just be able to secure more gigs when we're home too. So yeah, in every sense of the word, I want to be more involved with teaching and leading workshops and retreats and all that. That's awesome. And what about you, Brandon? Um, For me, I think I'm going to focus on the business side. I think that's where my strengths are and we're kind of hitting a stride with the yoga nomads right now. Yeah. So I'll take that and scale it as hard and fast as I can. Cool. I love that. And you guys are just going to continue traveling until travel sort of doesn't appeal to you anymore? Yeah. You know, I think I think travel will always appeal to us. I think the level of priority that it takes in our life will change and fluctuate just with life. You know, we'd love to have kids someday, and that's hopefully in the more near future than, than not. And I think that'll affect our travel schedule, mm-hmm. but we'll always, always keep it in our lives. So... Ideally, if we're dreaming for a little bit, um, we'd have a place in the U.S., probably Minnesota, maybe somewhere else, and then a place somewhere warmer so that six months out of the year or four months out of the year, we can stay in one place and then the rest of the year be in the other. And then just take trips from there. You know, being in Asia, that's the appeal of being in Bali later this year is it's so cheap to travel around in Southeast Asia. So we can just hop on a cheap flight for the weekend or a long weekend and go somewhere entirely different that we've never been before. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I think over the last couple of years, the travel has slowed down and I think it'll just continue to stay at a slower pace, which just fits our lifestyle and our our goals as of now, but that could all change. So, yeah, yeah. It seems like the slow traveling is more suited for being able to teach and having time and space to work on an online business. Yeah. Um, I feel like obviously when you work online, you need to have good Wi Fi and exactly. that's. And even a little bit of a routine helps. You know, I think we tried to escape that so much and we went polar opposite right when we started traveling. But then you kind of realize like healthy routines are really good for you. And 
just being human, it, it can help you function in a more motivated way. So I think as long as we can travel slowly and have a home base, even for two months, it helps us get into those routines, whether it's business or personal or anything. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I totally agree. I think it's something that I've tried to escape from with travel as well is like, Oh, I can't handle this. Like being on the train, going to work, sitting in my pencil skirt every single day and then going to the exact opposite and like being in a new city every three, four days. And then, you know, there's finding balance where you shake up your routine every couple months instead of every couple of years and that sort of thing. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Awesome. Just one final question for you guys. Um, do you have any recommendations you want to leave people with specifically kind of like newer teachers who are starting out their career and who maybe want to travel and teach or just start their teaching career in general? I would say get some experience under your belt before combining it with travel because at home you have all your comforts, your friends, everything's familiar. And if you just jump right into teaching on the road, you know, then you have to battle with a new local customs, a new language, a new place, etc. So after getting some experience at home, I would look at doing an exchange program through yoga trade and be open to the location because you might not get to teach at your dream location, but there's little hidden gems in every place. So finding a place where you can spend a couple months teaching regularly, um, I think will, number one, give you the confidence to excel long-term at teaching, and also it'll be a, a safe place to learn uh, and progress your teaching because they know they're picking up a newer teacher. Cool. cool. I, that. I also think if you're teaching to travelers, they're much more open-minded and they're much more willing of having a, a new and different class. If you teach at home at the same studio where all the classes are kind of the same, you might be the weird one at that studio. <laughs> it's always good to be weird though, you know? Yeah, yeah. not in the best way, but, <laughs> but the students might expect the normal class where if you're on the road, they're more open. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. I really, I love that point. <laughs> And I would say just to piggyback on that, stay open, stay flexible, um, and don't be afraid to go with the flow. I mean, it's so easy to forget that when you're in a routine at home, but when you're traveling, it's, it's a little bit easier to just kind of go with where things take you. And that's really important when you're traveling and trying to teach. Yeah, definitely. That's awesome. Cool. Do you guys have anything else that you want to add? I don't think so. No. I don't know. I think everyone should be listening to your podcast. <laughs> well, thank you. I think everyone should. For sure. <laughs> yeah, I think everyone should check out your website as well. And people can find you at theyoganomads.com. Is that the best place to find you guys? Exactly. Absolutely. Yep. Social media is all the same name, the Yoga Nomads. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much, guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hopefully everyone enjoyed that interview with Anne and Brandon from the Yoga Nomads. And to find more information about them, you can visit www.theyoganomads.com. You can also find links and photos on the show notes at www.mbomyoga.com. And just a few things quickly before you, before you leave the episode, before I sign off. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, feel free to reach out to me at info at mbomyoga.com. I would love to hear from you. You can also sign up for the weekly newsletter where you'll be the first to know about new episodes, new products coming out, and all of that. You just have to visit the website, mbomyoga.com. You can sign up for it on the newsletter tab or on the sidebar. And I also just launched a store. So if you want the full 10 steps to becoming a successful yoga teacher, you can purchase that in the store now. And I'm super excited about the new store and I'm looking forward to all the new products that are going to be coming out hopefully shortly. And as always, thank you so much for being a part of the MBOM community. If you want to like the page on Facebook, it's Mastering the Business of Yoga. And thanks for listening. Thanks for joining me and namaste.